yep, I'm old. <laughs> so I'll start with that. Um, I, um, I call, I, I like to always say that we're on the road to awesome because I think this industry is on the road to awesome. And so I just want to say, since we are old, quoting from the 60s, keep the faith, baby. We're going to get there. So um, I'm really, really honored to be here. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. And um, I got asked to talk about innovation, which is absolutely my favorite topic. Why do we need innovation? So um, let me start with this. Just a couple of really fun predictions. This is uh, one of my favorites. The telephone's never going to be of any value. I guess we proved that one wrong. Um, heavier than air flying machines? Ain't going to happen. I bet you all got here on a plane. Um, the radio. People were talking about the radio at a time when point to point, the telegraph was a means of communication. And so nobody could imagine point to many broadcasting. Does that even make sense? Probably not. Scratch that from the list. And then, of course, all my favorite computer forecasts. And my absolute favorite is this one, 640K. I bet you nobody who's under 40 in this room even knows what a K of memory is. <laughs> so why are all these people so wrong? How could they be so wrong? These are all really smart people. And the answer is very simple. Predictions are nothing more than an extrapolation of the past. You base the future that you're predicting on what you know today. So when Bill Gates said we don't need more than 640K of memory, what he was trying to tell his programmers was very simply, we can write Excel and Word in a way that is so efficient that you only need 640K of memory. He never imagined that we'd want phones and videos and music and mail on these devices, right? And so, since he couldn't imagine that, he couldn't predict that you would need more than 640K of memory. And so what we're all in the business of doing is innovation. What innovation does is it expands what's possible. It takes you from a reality of today to a future that then becomes conventional wisdom. And that's what we're all trying to, to do. And so, in my mind, this is absolutely true. Don't worry about predicting the future. You can't. But what you can do is set yourself on a path to a future that you want, and you can go off and create that future. That's really what we want. So we're all sitting here, so why are we talking about inventing the future? Why does the future need to be invented? Well, in my mind, it has to be invented or reinvented because the future of energy cannot look like the today of energy. It absolutely cannot, okay? Why not? Energy demand is expected to double in the next 40 to 50 years. Today, we use 85 million barrels of petroleum every day. There's an expectation that we'll double that. And if you listen to Chevron more than 10 years ago saying, very simply, the age of easy oil is over. We're not going to argue that you can't get fossils. What we're going to argue is that if we have to double consumption, you're going to have to go to the Arctic or to deep wells or to fracking, things which maybe are not as easy to do as some of the ways we've gotten oil out before. The other reason that we need to be cognizant and create a different energy future is as we double our energy consumption, the other thing we have to do is reduce our carbon emissions. And we need to do that for two reasons. One is that we're really spewing a lot of greenhouse gases into the air every single year. But the other reason what people don't talk about is that the combustion of fossil fuels also leads to the air looking like that. There are hundreds of cities in the world today 
where the PM 2.5 is greater than 100 parts, <laughs> who says World Health Organization needs that number to be under 10 for it to be safe. And we're talking about people that live in environments where they're basically breathing coal dust. I mean, it's dirt that gets into their lungs. So it's not just greenhouse gases that we need to stop from getting spewed into the air. And the third reason is the one here, and it's actually personally the one I care the most about. 1.3 billion people in the world today don't have access to energy. So while we double consumption, while we reduce greenhouse gases, we also need to make sure that every man, woman, and child has access to energy. Imagine not being able to study at night because you can't read a book. You cannot advance. Anyways, so for these three reasons, it behooves all of us to reinvent the future to create a future of energy that is distinctly different than that of today. And to me, the way to do that, that means every solution, every possible path to new energy that is sustainable has to have a seat at the table, okay? And that's what we're here to do, is to bring in more new molecules into the pool. The other thing I think is important to talk about is the fact that, as I mentioned, carbon is also can cause pollution. So we need to start thinking about how we use carbon. If our goal is not to bring in a lot of new carbon, then we need to use carbon efficiently. The way that I think about that is energy. The world knows how to do energy without carbon. Solar, wind, these things are starting to be absolutely economic and in many places competitive with even natural gas-based power. Liquid fuels and chemicals, on the other hand, have to have carbon. And so what we need is to make sure that new carbon is reserved for those uses. And the other thing we need to think about is recycling of carbon. Carbon cannot be about a single use. You recycle paper. You recycle aluminum, you recycle plastic, but we don't recycle carbon. We use it and then we emit it. Not good enough. So, I would argue, being a Star Trek fan, <laughs> that we need to focus on carbon. Last century was space. Space was the final frontier. Space is what we had to conquer. We've conquered space, we've gone to the moon. What we now need to do is conquer carbon. We need to find better ways of using carbon. We need to find ways of bringing new carbon into the pool that makes sense from an economic, social, and environmental perspective. And that's what we're all here to do. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do as a company, our journey, just as an example of technology. <clears throat> I've been in this sector for more than 10 years, 15 years now. And, um, you know, um, I never heard of this. So <laughs> I guess it shows you that the future can be very different than even the supposed experts um, think it is. What we do is we recycle carbon. You're used to the fermentation of sugar. You're used to organisms that take carbon and energy from a sugar molecule. Our organism takes its carbon and its energy from a carbon monoxide molecule. That is absolutely all it needs. If it has hydrogen, it will use it. If it doesn't have hydrogen, it will make it. It does water gas shift. The other thing that's really interesting about this is, unlike conventional fermentation, it's not a batch process. This is a continuous process. I come from the refining industry. I love continuous processes. This chemistry happens in seconds, and so it becomes an issue of getting enough food, carbon monoxide, to the organism in the liquid, in the solution. Because sugar is soluble in water, but carbon monoxide is not. So it's not just a bio challenge, it's also an engineering challenge, making sure you can dissolve, in quotes, enough carbon monoxide in the... The beauty of this is completely outside of the food chain, the beauty of this is it literally takes carbon monoxide, which is often flared, and brings it right back into the pool. 
Sometimes when I talk about this, I think, my gosh, that sounds like science fiction. But it's not, okay? We've built two 100,000 gallon per year demonstration facilities in China. One at Bao Steel, which is the largest steel company in China, and the other at Xiaogang, which is the fourth largest steel company in China. Both of these have produced at 100,000 gallons per year, and Bao Steel has now provided the financing to build the first commercial unit. What I did, though, is I showed you a 50-day run at the Shogang site. And the reason I showed you that with the nice bumps is for a reason. In the refining sector, you cannot afford to shut down because a compressor dies, right? And so we had those types of problems here. And I always think of biotechnology as lab prima donnas. I come from a thermochem world, and I think those organisms, they're just going to roll over and play dead if you look at them cross-eyed. But they don't, OK? We shut down the plant to fix a compressor. We isolated the reactors. I told you it was continuous. And then as soon as we fixed the compressor, a few hours later, we started it back up went right back to full production capacity. So I would argue that instead of thinking about bio as prima donnas, think of it as us, right? You can walk away and you can walk outside when it's 100 degrees and you can walk outside when it's minus 20 and you're fine, right? We adapt. Some days you don't get water as much as you want, but we're fine. So that's the way to think about this chemistry. It's actually really, really robust. What are we trying to do? The same thing you're all trying to do. Get across the fabled valley of death. <laughs> um, the reality is that the bigger a unit, the more steel you're putting on the ground, the more it costs. And the more it costs, the less likely somebody is to want to bet on it, right? because that means they're taking a bigger risk. So the first of a kind is always very, very hard to get built. But I always find that everybody wants to be first to be second. So as soon as you've built the first one, it's downhill from there. And so that's what we're all trying to do, and that's what we're trying to do. And we have agreement from Bow Steel, like I said. At the Bow Metal Board level, they've agreed to finance the first commercial unit. So we're in the detailed design of that. I started by telling you that all molecules that can have a seat at the table need to be sustainable. So I would be remiss if I don't talk about sustainability at least for a few minutes. The way we think about our process is shown here. Every time I can take a carbon monoxide molecule and prevent it from being combusted and emitted to the air, I reduce carbon emissions. But in addition, for every carbon molecule I bring into the pool that I can take to ethanol, that's a new fossil molecule that doesn't have to be converted to gasoline. So there's two ways of having an impact. One is by reducing the, num the new molecules that are coming in to become gasoline, and the other by stopping the flaring. If you do both of those things and you do carbon accounting, you can look at the CO2, NOx, SOx, and particular emissions that we're preventing by doing this. There's, of course, you have to take into account the energy that we use in running our process. But net net, every time that we make a ton of ethanol, we prevent carbon, particles, NOx, and SOx from going out into the air. And that's all very, very important. So this is carbon capture and reuse if you make ethanol. We can also make chemicals, and what that means is carbon capture and sequestration. Um, I don't want to build a commercial production facility. That's not my end goal. What we want to do is build a company. We want to build a company that can take a variety of gases and ferment them and make fuels, chemicals, and food. And I'll talk about that in a second. I mentioned that if you carbon capture and put it into a chemical, that's the same as sequestration. In this case, we're using synthesis gas. Our native organism that we've optimized can make ethanol and 2,3-butane dial. 
and we can take that 2,3-butane diol and convert it to butadiene. Butadiene is a critical raw material for rubber and nylon. We're working with Invista, the largest supplier of nylon in the world, and we're working with SK out of Korea, who's actually doing the 2,3-BDO to butadiene conversion. So this is a route from a gas to a chemical. And I think this is actually really, really important for a couple of reasons. These are commodity chemicals, right? If you've ever worked with commodity chemicals, you know that today the price per ton for butadiene could be $1,500 a ton. Six months ago, it was $3,500 a ton, and these prices go up and down because they're all made from commodities. They're either made from gas or from sugar or from fossils. If you can make chemicals outside of the chemical value chain, you should be able to dampen those fluctuations. So what we're doing here is taking feedstocks that cannot be traded. You're not going to move gas around. You just can't. So by definition, these can't be commodity feedstocks. And that changes the dynamics. I talked about butadiene. That was with our native organism. What we've learned to do, and by the way, everybody told us you could not get a gas-eating organism genetically modified. Okay? So, not true. And by the way, every time somebody tells you it's not possible to do something, you know it is. It, I guarantee you it is. Um, we've been able to make, through genetic modification, more than 20 key chemicals. We've done some of these in continuous fermentation, which means we have run for over um, 45 days. And the organism, which replicates every couple of days, has not rejected the material. So that's a really important piece, because putting it in is hard, but making sure the organism wants to live with it is even harder. And so indeed, we're able to show that we can do this. And we're working with a number of chemical companies to scale this up. I've already talked about that. The way I think about this is, in some ways, the way we've been taught to think about it by the DOE. Use every last bit of the feedstock. It's not just one part, it's the whole barrel, right? And that's how we think about it. The way the petrochemical industry has been successful is they make fuels for volume and chemicals for value. We're doing the same thing. We're making products or co-products that are both fuels and chemicals. And on a farm to fly day, we're also converting that alcohol to jet fuel in collaboration with PNNL. One last thing I wanted to talk about is direct conversion of CO2. I started this by talking about carbon monoxide, but let's talk about carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide for an organism is very much like sugar. It has carbon, it has energy. Carbon dioxide is carbon. There is no energy there. So for our organism to survive on carbon dioxide, we need to bring in hydrogen as its source of energy. When we do that, we can make products. And what we've been able to do is show we can make acetate. Well, unfortunately, the world of economics always has to be paid its due. And the acetate we make in this process actually doesn't make economic sense. If you try to isolate it from a dilute broth, you will never compete. But what we've been able to show is there's lots of yeast and algae that eat sugar, right? Well, many of those eat acetate too. So what we've done is we've taken this broth, and rather than isolate the acetate, we say, well, wait a second. This has already got all the nutrients that we used to feed our organism. So it's going to feed the next bit. It's going to feed the yeast. It's going to feed the algae. And so what we've done is we've done that. And guess what? We can make lipids. And in the case of the work we're doing with Indian oil, those lipids actually are really high in omega-3s. And all of us who worry about greenhouse gases, I would ask you to worry about aquaculture too. Every kilogram of tuna that you eat that's farmed took 22 kilograms of some type of fish meal that started life as a wild-caught fish, okay? 22 to 1. Because in the wild, fish eat algae to get their omegas. 
in a farm, they've got to be fed those omegas. And guess where they get them? They can't grow algae there, right? So what they do is they go kill fish, make fish meal, and bring it to the farm. So what we're really excited about is now we're finding a path to a nutrient-rich lipid so we have an impact on food as well. And so we think that's actually really important and exciting. This is longer term, but we're on a path to make that happen. As John Lennon said, we'll get by with the help of our friends. A company like us is way too small to get by on its own. But we've been very fortunate that a lot of our partners believe that what we're doing makes sense and that they want us to be part of the story. So we continue to make progress with these partnerships. I want to just finish by saying a few words about biotechnology. I'm a thermochem girl. <laughs> All of you who know me know that I'm a thermochem girl. <laughs> what you might not know is that actually my PhD thesis was on Fischer trope synthesis, believe it or not, and that was 30 years ago, okay? So, um, been doing this for a while and loved and still love thermochem. But one of the things I've come to realize is thermochem alone isn't gonna get us into past the energy situation we're in. We need biochem as well. And the beauty of biochem is that medical research relies on the same biochem. So hundreds of trillions of dollars are put into medical research and pharmaceutical research every day. So if you can learn to map the genome of a human being to feed, learn what drug to give them, it's the same tools that we're going to use in biochem to map the genome of our organisms. And so that synergy, I believe, is going to make biotech grow very, very quickly, very, very quickly over the next few years. And the other reason I think biochem is extremely important is because when I envision a low-carbon future, I don't envision it looking exactly like energy today. Today we make massive refineries where 200,000 barrels of capacity are processed every single day. That's great and we'll continue to have that fossil future. It has to be part of the future energy mix. But the new things that we bring in, maybe they should be distributed. Maybe those feedstocks also are important in a distributed fashion. So if you believe feedstocks for the future of energy, some of that will come from distributed feedstocks, then you have to start thinking about the fact that biology allows you to build things in small scale. The other thing that's really important is if you want to do something that's distributed, you want to incorporate molecular diversity. Every single feedstock in a distributed fashion does not look exactly the same. So if you're going to process them in a distributed fashion, you've got to have something that's adaptable, something that actually could be used in a, dis in a very different context. So the fact that our organism can use a basic oxygen furnace CO in a steel mill or a syngas from an MSW plant that you can do with the same exact organism. It's not a different catalyst. That type of molecular diversity is enabling and is really important. And it can only be found in, in, in biological organisms. And then the third reason is because I believe the future is about flexibility. You hear people talk about the need for flexibility, and you also hear people talk about complexity. Well, in biological organisms, complexity is free. Why does everybody love 3D printers? I can prototype 100 times in what I could prototype in a year before if I use a 3D printer. Bioorganisms allow complexity. I'll give you an example. If I have a genetically modified organism that can make propanol, and propanol market all of a sudden isn't worth anything, I don't want to make propanol anymore, but now I'm stuck with the steel in the ground. If I had an organism that could make butanol, I can use my same assets with the new organism and make a different product. Okay, rapid prototyping, perhaps. It's not prototyping at that point, it's commercial. But it's a different way of thinking about the world. Okay, I believe we have to think about it differently. Okay. 
enough of that. So I will steal a page from Vinod Kosla, who owns a big chunk of the company, and he likes to talk about black swans. He likes to talk about ideas, one in a million idea. I think to be successful, you need one in a million ideas, one in a million business models, and one in a million individuals, people who dare to do something different. I also believe that since carbon is the final frontier, what we all need is a carbon moonshot. We need great big chunks of science and math. Great work is still left to be done to conquer this world. And I would tell all of you <laughs> that we are on the road to awesome and that the future of energy depends on us being successful. And so I would argue that it's time for us to be the Avengers and be the superheroes for our children. And so I will end with my favorite quote. I believe that if one always looked at the skies, one would end up with wings. Thanks for your attention.